and also um, I'm I'm doing that through any kind of way. I go across the country and speak. I have a reality show called Rescue Addiction. I have a film that I just released that's called It's Clinical that really touches on that very heavy. And I have a couple projects coming up as well, more movies about um, mental health that um, just targets, you know, black, brown, Latinos, the young, and the hood, you know. Um, you know, just we have to break the stigma. That's just 100% what it is. And, um, you know, Escambia County is number one for opioid overdoses, have been number one for 24 straight months. And uh, one of the biggest reasons for that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, y'all, I just forget this disclaimer. I hold no punches. Uh, but you got you got people like um, uh, State Representative Salzman. That's one of the big reasons why we are we are number one. Um, I have a real axe to ground with her and how she, you know, takes <laughs> like a gatekeeper to the DCF dollars that's allocated to our county. And she guards it with her life and whoever can kiss her butt the most is that's when she allowed the money to goes to. Um, I've never been in the kissing butt industry, so I, there's always around it, a uh, way around it. I feel that, you know, you have to be, um, have the funds to to outspend the problem or you have to have the mind to outthink the problem. And right now I'm doing a great job of outthinking the problem. But the um, the way these politicians, not just her, a lot of people in the county commission um, that just have the money with the the everything with the opioid abatement fund and that board, the way they put that together and the way they go to these county commissioners, people who know nothing about mental illness, some of them seem to have mental illness of their own, and I'm not going to get into that, um, <clears throat> don't know nothing about it. And it goes straight to the same usual suspects, some of the same entities that have been uh, investigated by the Santez uh, general inspector, uh, general investigator, and all they're doing is throwing pennies at the problem while the problem still exists. We don't know if they're bumping up their salaries or whatever, but we one thing we do know it's not trickling down, which is the reason why we remain in the top spot that no one wants, and that's number one in opioid overdoses. So, so Jermaine, how what? What what made you, uh, well, how did you get into um, doing it when, when you uh, doing drugs when you were? Uh, how did I start doing drugs? Yeah. Oh, it's, um, like my story, probably the same as everyone. Uh, a little bit of mix of a product of my environment. Then I was rapping. I was fourteen. I was young. Um, mm -hmm. and so unfortunately, it's just a part of the culture and um. You know, at that time, you know, I'm strong enough to say back then I wasn't strong enough to think for myself. And I just really wanted to, um, you know, I, I, I was not strong enough to stand out and, and you know, go against the grain. Um, but I'm, I'm here now, though. <laughs> <laughs> I know um, it's been a lot of um, been up death uh, lately. Uh, they've been talking about um how is that affecting the community overall oh, it's, it's it's really it's tearing us apart and you know the fentanyl is present in all drugs uh, even the marijuana now um you know like when i i just moved here from moved back home from duval county jacksonville which um i remember Y'all know I love Miss McIntosh and I miss her dearly, but I remember I called into the show last, last time and I talked about <clears throat> what we were doing over there to flip Duval Blue. And I, I brought up the issue about flipping the Scambia Blue. Um, uh, but I, when I was over there, you know, I was working with Northeast Florida Healthy Start Coalition. And no matter what, they pay me to go into these rooms and talk about Duval County. But when the numbers hit my desk, I always go to Scambia first. And, you know, the presence, um, <clears throat> drug-free Florida run these tests about, they get their hands on the drugs and they test the drugs for the presence of fentanyl. That's so much, I think at one point, 90% of street drugs, that's everything included from weed to the toughest thing you could think of 
Um, they all had the presence of fentanyl in it. Mr. Williams, uh, first of all, congratulations, man, on that nine-year sobriety. That's not Thank something you. to be taken lightly, especially with uh, amphetamine as strong as cocaine. Um Thank you for what you do, man, and not just getting out, but looking back and throwing the rope to try to help somebody else. What will you say, Mr. Williams, is the 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 point that you got in your addiction that you said enough is enough and want it change? I, the, the, I think I got to that point almost 20 times over a span of 13 years. Um and and this is one thing I tell my clients all the time. There is no textbook way for change. You know, each individual is different. Um, me personally, I, I tried rehab that I, I relapsed the, after 90 days being in there. I relapsed the next day of getting out. I had an Old Testament miracle of me crying out to God doing praise and worship that happened for me, which is covered in my documentary that's on YouTube. But that's, that's a way that God intervened for me. Um, you know, everyone doesn't know the Lord like I do. And not to say that God don't do did me, you know, not to say God just looked out for me, but I am one of his favorites. And I know that for a fact. Amen, but, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, but, brother. <laughs> but I will I will say though that it's just so much still a lot of you know my grandmother. If you if you do know who she is or not, I promise you a lot of you do. She's been part of movement for change forever. Her name is Doris Johnson. Um, when I was stealing out her purse, that's my everything. That's the most important person on this planet for me. Um, she's gone now, but at that time, and when I got to a low of stealing from her, well, you don't have to steal from her. She'll give you whatever you want. Um, even if she know it was going to harm you, I, those kind of things, um, just totally out of character. But the point of suicide um, many times, many of times. So I can't point to one thing. I know it's so many because most people that's on drugs and alcohol don't want to be in that state. And again, if they're in Pensacola and in Scambia County, if they want to change, it's easier to do the drugs than get the help to change. And that's a sad state. So, so how would they get in contact with you, uh, Jermaine? Um, my, then you can hit me up on Facebook. Uh, Jermaine J. Williams is my name on Facebook um, and Instagram. Um, again, Jermaine J. Williams. That's the best way I can say as of right now. I'm trying to set up a structure. I did just launch my nonprofit with Sean Yabui called Lens of Hope. Well, we just we're doing something called the Youth Film Academy uh, because we did the movie is clinical, which was 100 percent of teaching everyone in the community what mental health looks like um, through an entertainment scope because you know most people hear stuff like I I have I found out that the reason why my addiction was so hard was because of my mental diagnosis of bipolar 2 intermittent explosive disorder and complex PTSD at the time I didn't know that and I was trying to self-medicate so getting off the drugs was just one thing but the confetti didn't drop because most people around me didn't believe I was off drugs because I was still displaying symptoms of being on drugs and that was 100% due to my mental untreated mental diagnosis when I got those things in order there was no doubt um, and in anyone's mind that I was not only clean, but, you know, just having everything in order. But I never forget when I called my brother and I told him, you know, hey, I got a mental diagnosis. This is what they said I have. You know, my brother, uh, our, our father died when I was six. So I, he's the closest thing I have to a father. And I called him and I told him, they, they said, I got bipolar. They said, I got intermittent, you know, telling them all these things. And he said, hey, man, don't believe that. You know, they just want to get money off you. You know, black folks don't this, that, this, that, and the third. I said, okay, well, let me read you the Google definition of intermittent explosive disorder. He said, oh, that's spot on. You need to do whatever the hell they're telling you to do. <laughs> and <laughs> so that was uh, <laughs> that was the thing. Most people, and that's just funny, in a, a span of five minutes, he went from stigma driven to, oh, snap, that's you. And so, you know, and the movie is clinical helps 
illustrate exactly what mental illness looked like. And especially with our people, you know, for one thing about us, Lord have mercy, help us. We laugh about everything, but we use that because we've been through so much, so much, whether it's slavery, Jim Crow school, the prison pipeline, we got to laugh to keep from crying. And so what is clinical takes on a serious conversation wrapped in comedy. And um, so much so to where some of the actors who ran after we um, showed the film just to the actors before we showed it to the public. A lot of them went and got their own mental, um, mental evaluations and led them to do that. So, you know, we just screened it last week at the Black Mental Health Symposium. Um, and, you know, we, we're doing a lot of great things. And as much as I want to keep the focus on this clinical and the upcoming movie, PTSD, it's all getting overshadowed by our new documentary on Willie Jr. So we're taking on a lot. We're taking on a lot. <laughs> you know, I, I am going to ask you to talk a little bit more about it's clinical and then PTSD. But I am, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to even front and tell the story that I am super hella. I even talked to Cheryl. We had a whole conversation about Willie Jr. and and all of the the story that is Willie Jr. Right. So uh, if you could talk to us a little bit about uh, uh, its clinical and PTSD and what the how what it's about, the frame it for us, and then for those who have not had an opportunity to see it, how can they see it? Okay, so it's clinical. It's, it's pretty much, it, it's not about my life, but I am the main character. And I'm not an actor, but I did act in it because I didn't trust no one to display it the right way. So it's about me, somewhat me, and um, and I'm how I'm struggling to take on my mental, my three diagnoses that I said earlier. But to drive the point home, it's like whenever I'm experienced like anger from the intermittent explosive disorder, there's a person that pops up. Um, and in this case, um, intermittent explosive disorder was played by a little cute girl. And when she opened her mouth, the thing she would say is not a cute little girl, <laughs> you know, and she would drive me to do certain things. Or when there's a scene in the movie where bipolar pops up, and I go on this excessive spending spree and, you know, she's egging me on to spend my money when I know I shouldn't, which is a symptom of bipolar when you're in the manic state. So, you know, I use these hidden figures that no one else could see but me. And it's comedy, the banner by going back and forth. It's funny things that black people say and we do. And some, most, so many people like, oh, I didn't even know that was some block. I thought bipolar was just a mood thing. You know, they don't know about the excessive spending and all these things. So when they start seeing some of the symptoms displayed, we had PTSD that was played by Ty. every actor just killed it. Um, Ty played PTSD. And it was like, and at the time, my girlfriend on the film, me and her was getting into it. But the whole setting that was set up by that reminded me in the film, it reminded me of my ex-girlfriend who abused me mentally and somewhat physically. So when PTSD showed up, he was doing things. And the next thing you know, the girlfriend turned into the ex-girlfriend. So it played out that form of PTSD, what it looks like in someone's mind. And my one of my best friends, um, I know you all know Tommy Gunn. So we we played uh intermittent explosive disorder shows up when I get fired from fire from um 1216 as a pot washer. And she urged me to cuss out Tommy, and I did, and it led me to get fired. Um I had a friend, he's he's in New York, but we live in Jacksonville for years, best friend. He'd seen me get fired in that way at least 17 times in Jacksonville when I didn't know that I had those diagnoses. And when he saw the movie come, he said, I seen that scene so many times in real life. Is that really what be going on in your mind? I was like, yeah, that's what, that's what happens. So that's, that's, um, it's clinical. We have PTSD that we're just about to, uh, I wrote that about two years ago, but we're, we're about to start filming that. And it's a mix of the movie Get Out, um, with, you know, mental health. And, um, it's like a, a horror, psychological thriller with you know the uh, mental health heavy at the forefront and this is a great movie i can't really talk about too much about it because it gives it away but it is really really good everything that i do has a purpose behind it um i mean there's 
I'm, I just can't wait till I get the opportunity to bring all my films to the forefront. We have this one movie we got I wrote called Color Cavalry, which, you know, one of the main figures in that is um, John Sunday. Um, he's one of the main characters in the Color Cavalry. And it's a myth, but I heard it's a true story that happened somewhere around Alabama. I don't know how true it is. But in that movie, you know, there's this these guys that that have like somewhat of a small black Wall Street between here and Mobile, and they wanted they needed more money, um, so they left their family behind to join the Buffalo Soldiers who were recruiting in nearby Louisiana. So when they go there, um, have before they can even get to Pensacola, someone rides a horse and let them know that they're small. Um, that their small black Wall Street has been pillaged by white people and they killed everybody. So they they end up going to Louisiana, stealing all the guns from all the um, all the people, uh, all the color, um, excuse me, all the um, Buffalo soldiers get all this ammunition. They meet John Sunday. John Sunday pledges a lot of help from Pensacola and they go back and they get revenge. So uh, that's a great movie. That's just, I, I can't wait till I get the opportunity to show you everything that we have, that we're working on. And again, all these great things are still just being overshadowed by Willie Jr. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um. We, we have so much, we have rescue addiction where we, we um, it's a reality show where I lead a team of therapists, uh, psychiatrists, all kinds of people. And we go into these situations uh, and we help turn them around. And the same thing that healed me and my family, because it's one thing to become sober, then now you got to heal the family because just because I'm sober, my family's not sober for what I put them through. And so, you know, we went in and we helped the family and, uh, you know, that's another project that we're working on. But and also to answer your question, uh, we haven't found a home yet for um, it's clinical. So we're we're talking to so many people. We have a product, a product from Pensacola named um, James Harris. He was a uh, I went to school with him. I met him um, when I went from Escambia to Washington and we both are big products of Carla Ross and Miss Ross Decker program over there. And, uh, but he works at Rockefeller Plaza now in New York. And so he's been trying to shop his clinical around and we've been having meetings and, you know, until we see if we can land it on a big platform, we, we just don't know. But if anyone on this panel is interested in watching the film, I could definitely uh, send it to you guys uh, sometime tonight when we wrap here. I would like yeah. to see it again. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I saw, yeah. I, I have to say, good evening, everyone. I have to say, I went to the it's, it's clinical premiere at Belmont, and I was blown away. It was, um, Jermaine is, is being very modest. Um, I, I, I would have thought he was an actor because he did uh, excellent in the, in the film. And um, just the realness of, uh, the 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 characters and the the disorders. It you know I learned something. It was um, insightful. It, it prompted me to want to get an evaluation. Uh, you know because it's so subtle. You don't think that it could be an actual you know diagnosis um, for for mental illness. But after the film, um, Jermaine had like an open dialogue. And the amount of people who who um, had a second thought about their own mental um, diagnoses and 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 wanted to get tested, and people just being real about uh, de depression and certain feelings, it was moving. It was moving, and I thank you so much for bringing that conversation to the forefront in our culture because we often dismiss it. Um, like you said, your brother, you know, um, did. So I, I just I just thank you so much. It is I, I hope everyone goes out and sees this film. Thank you. I do believe you are being kind when you say that he was being modest, but uh I think that once you've lived something and has gone through what he has, it may be a little easier for him to be able to do it and get across exactly what it is that he is trying to display. Just the the spirit that he tells his stories with shows the authenticity and how real it is to him and alive. So 
Uh, man, I can. I, I wish you nothing but continued success. You got your hands in a whole bunch of different things, man, and that's awesome, man. That you 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 went from uh you, you did a complete one eighty, man, and it's headed in the complete opposite direction and doing powerful things. Uh, but I'm really really excited to hear that uh, Willie Junior story. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the the Willie Willie Jr. is the one thing that's um you y'all know we we in Pensacola, so we've had little subtle threats. Um, uh, but them folks don't know me. I learned on the Leroy Boyd. I don't care about no threat. But um I I I, I tell you that it's still the people here that don't want this story to be done. And I'm here to tell them just hey, just be ready. And, you know, because this one, the, the amount of work that we're putting in and the amount of stuff we're putting out, they, I, how much danger we're putting ourselves in. Yeah, we, we're putting this on Amazon and you're going to have to pay to watch this one. <laughs> like uh -oh. But um, I, we, we sat down with Willie Jr.'s sister, his only surviving sibling. Uh, we sat down with her, Charmaine, the last, one of the last people that seen him alive over at me and, me and moms that cut his hair. Um, and, oh, I wish I could say so much. I, I really got to be careful what I say because I normally don't care about what I say, but I got to be careful because yeah. we're still in the process of trying to get some things done. And I don't want nobody to rail us and cut us off of what we're trying to do. So if I talk about this and I stop and I think, just know I'm not used to doing that. I just, I let it fly out. So, um, but yeah, we, we are, we've sat down and talked to so many people. And a lot of people, we are exploring three possibilities and majority of it, we're leaving on the audience to decide. We are exploring that he's still alive, which we have heard a lot. We've heard that Willie Jr. has a tan over in Hawaii right now. <laughs> um, I'm, right, he's the Pensacola Elvis. And mm -hmm. uh, we also heard that, of course, he died by suicide and he was murdered, you know, so... We are putting all three of those out there. We are exploring them in depth and we are letting the audience figure it out. That's where we're at right now. But I yeah. will tell you every day that I wake up, this documentary takes a different turn. So what I tell you today may not be true tomorrow. And uh, we have so much. Yeah, yes, and we have a lot. Um, when I tell you, when we announced it, that we were doing it. Uh, because my partner, Sean Yabui, a lot of people know him, but he's not from here, but he's very active in this community. Everybody loves and loves Sean. Um, so I called him and this was just, they were doing this uh, film competition, a 10 minute film competition. I called him, I said, yeah, we got, it's clinical out the way. You know, I know we're going to do some more with, it's clinical. I said, let's, let's, it's time to do Willie Jr. He was just like, yeah, it's whatever, bro. You know, whatever you want to do. I said, okay, he don't know what he getting himself into. So I posted it on Facebook. And at the time, <laughs> I made the mistake because I just went and made a cover for it real quick. And I, at the time, did not think it all the way through. I didn't have a title <laughs> for it. So the title that I put on there was Who Killed Willie Jr.? <laughs> And that caused a lot of backlash. And that just went everywhere. And Sean calls me and said, yo, who is Willie Jr.? Why is everybody talking like this? And he went and he looked it up. He said, oh, we're definitely doing this. We're definitely doing this. He knew how real it was because his wife worked somewhere. I don't want to say, but she worked somewhere. Uh, city, county influence. And she was, she was, she was asked about it. And so I said, okay, yeah, let's change the name. So we did change the name to uh, Man of the People, the final hours of Willie Jr. A lot more subtle. So, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we have the trailer um, and we have a little preview for it. Um, it's, it's, it's really coming out good. But again, we have learned so much about i i you know i'm from here and at the time i was grown i was in tallahassee i wasn't going to school there but i did walk around fam you with a book with a book bag but i didn't go there you know <laughs> a lot of nice females out there um <laughs> but i was living in tallahassee at the time and um i remember i remember it vivid and i remember like here's the thing that really made 
made me mad when we announced that we were doing it. It went viral in the city. And people my age and younger just pretty much signed our death certificate. So I went live and I said, you know what? When y'all see each other down there at Chasers or at the club or whatever, if somebody look at you wrong, you ready to kill them if they look like you. But the moment you want to see what happened to the first black county commissioner since reconstruction in this county, you want to give this man some kind of justice. That's when you get scared. You scared of the wrong thing. You know, you got aggression for the wrong thing and you got fear for the wrong thing. And the sad thing about it is the fear of your grandmother has been passed down to you in this show. And I clean it up, clean it up. Don't sign my death certificate. Um, Malcolm X said a lot, but one of the best quotes he ever said was, I've never did nothing I wasn't ready to face the consequences for. And taking on this documentary, I can't sum it up better than that. Yeah, I was going to ask you, and you just kind of alluded to it, uh, for those, like, I, I feel like, uh, well, I know Cheryl knows, but I feel like maybe Jill and Christina are left out a little bit in the fact that they don't know who Willie Jr. is. Can you, you just, or for our viewing, oh, you know who Willie Jr. is, Jill? Oh, no, see, I didn't think y'all did. For the, oh, no, uh, for, okay. For, because they're not from Pensacola, so for them and the rest of the people who might be watching who are transplants are like, why are they so animated about somebody named Willie Jr.? Can you share just a little bit, not going into detail about the film, but just what you know of who Willie Jr. is? Yeah, so Willie Jr., um, okay, so at the time, a little bit before him, Pensacola was just represented. The county was, were, you know, just 100% white. And I, from what I understand, the NAACP sued to have the Black district. Um, and Willie Jr. reaped the benefits from that. And he was the first black county commissioner in Pens in the Scamby County since Reconstruction. And he was elected around the late 80s, mid late 80s. And he held the seat up until right about the time of his death. He did so much for black people. He was the man of the people, I guess, depending on who you ask. But he was the man of the people. But he found himself in a little trouble when he, uh, in my opinion, and um, I think Leroy Boyle was quoted as uh, trusted them white folks a little bit too much. Um, so what he did was he got into a little trouble um, uh, with some purchase of land and all the powerful people, um, included W.D. Childers, if his last name sounds familiar, his daughter-in-law, I believe, is Pam Childers, the one giving Lumen all the hell. Um, W.D. Childers was one of the most if not the most powerful person in the state of Florida over the governor at that time. Um, still to this day, W.D. Childers has the longest legislative server in the state of Florida. Um, he was the head of all that stuff that was going on. Pretty much, long story short, um, Willie Jr. said, bump all that, I'm turning on him. And Willie Jr., you know, when he told everything he knew, and uh, right before it was time for him to turn himself in, he went missing for a month. Everybody thought he was on the run. Um, and then he was discovered on the house full of antifreeze. And um, they don't know if he was, they, the cause of death was suicide in black and white. Um, but a lot of things just don't add up. And, you know, it scared black people so bad at that time, depending on who you were, um, it scared black people so bad to where they didn't even want to talk about it. I was talking to, I, I love this. I've never done this before. My documentary was on me and, you know, my struggles to help people that's going through substance misuse. But I'm starting to like really enjoy investigation journalism. This is so fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was talking to a ex WEAR news person. Y'all know who that person is. I just don't want to say it on here. And that person told me so much. Everybody's been telling me so much. And, you know, every time I, I bring up key people name, and I'm not going to bring them up here, but one of them was W.D. Childers. And um, 
I told her, I was like, black, not just black people, all people are so scared of Willie Jr. And I said, they act like if you said Willie Jr. named three times WD Children's and Joe, <laughs> well, we're up here. You know, it's just like, I mean, here it is. WD is, he's an old man. He's 90, 90 years old down in South Florida. Um, I'm sure he's a powerful man if he could remember some of the that he is powerful. I, I mean, you know, now I know he has his offsprings and I know their children are around and they want they're licking the chops to prove that they're just as ruthless as their predecessors and everything. Um, you know, so there's a there's a lot of people that's that's scared to this day. But again, the point that I wanted to make is that the fear from the grandparents, the fear from the older generation has been passed down to people our age uh, to where they want to jump in the comments and say, oh, y'all going to die. And, you know, I told them, man, well, if you say that, you might as well say, oh, oh, oh man, massacre, going man. You know, they're talking like a broken slave, like a, like a runaway slave. Y'all y'all going to get it. Y'all better not, you better leave that alone, you know. And, and, and again, it's been 20 years. You know, it's been 20 years. A lot of you all that is familiar with Willie Jr. Remember when they found his body. Remember when it happened. Remember the feelings you had. Remember the questions you have. And nothing still hasn't been proved. That's been 20 years ago. And I'm going to make it my mission that don't be 22 years until you have some answers. Well, my, my hat's off to you, brother. Uh, you. I, I remember... I remember Willie Jr. I remember well. I remember what happened, and now I'm kind of surprised some of the folks over in Okaloosa County don't know because you know that's why they had the the, the trial that was over in Okaloosa County uh, when all of this happened. I, and I didn't live here then, sir. I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> Just because I'm from Okaloosa, don't mean I know what but happened it, 20 years before I got here. <laughs> but that's where they had children's uh, trial at. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, an interesting. It's an interesting story. And it needs to be told. I, I'm quite surprised that somebody hadn't tried to tell that story before now, because oh, yeah. uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions uh, in that case, and and uh, and we know probably why folks are uh, not talking about it much. Is the Banner Rooster? Y'all, if you don't know who W. D. Childers is, he's mm -hmm. the same guy that tried to act like George Wallace. At Escambia yeah. High School, y'all remember that? Uh, maybe, maybe uh, Jerry, you maybe you weren't here at that time. Uh, no, I but wasn't here, but I had heard about it. You read. heard all about that story and, and stuff like that. So, um, and I'm surprised that some of it's still living. <laughs> you said if, if children still living? Yeah, still he's down it. in South Florida. Yeah, he's like, oh wow, wow, I didn't know that. I, uh, okay, I thought he was down there fighting fire, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> not fighting fire. And you know, and one of the things that uh, oh, I, I just gotta watch what I say, but you know, I grew up a Democrat, and I say grew up a Democrat because you know, like I'm a Democrat by default, but you know, I just I used to love Latin Childs. I used to think Latin Childs was just this great man and Governor Latin Childs, and then I started investigating on Willie Jr. and I was like. What a nasty man. Like, you know, it just, you, peeling back these onions give you, let you know who people really are. But that's been the case for a very long time. You know, I, I remember, you know, I remember that how much I love the Kennedy brothers. Um, and so I read how hard it was to change Robert Kennedy mind about the state of black people in Mississippi and the links the other black leaders had to do at that time just to get his attention. So, you know, all these people that were taught to be such great men and great leaders, and then you do a little Google here and dig a little over there, you're like a cracker. But, you know, that's just me, you know, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, you get what I'm saying, though. But, yes. um, but no, I, I, um, <laughs> I don't know. It's just, and, and I don't know. I don't know. It's a lot of things that hurt my feelings about that, about that Willie Jr., that story. And, you know, I think it's one of the biggest reasons why we're still in this state as black people in Pensacola. Like we've come a long way yet. We don't have nothing. And um, we're just so scary unless the person looks like us, you know, if the opposition looked like us, we got all the heart in the world. 
But if it's anything for us to gain meaningful progress here, uh, that's when people feet turn into a hundred, a uh, thousand pounds each. You know, there's no reason for a Hadley to have to work this damn hard for some votes. Yep. You know what I mean? And this is somebody that I still, I go to the club. I don't drink. I don't do most of that stuff. I I mean, that's again, I think that's another reason (laughs) why uh, my mom, she just so worried about me with this Willie Jr. stuff. But she said, well, at least, at least, you know, you look like a thug. So they'll think twice, you know, but, (laughs) 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 but, you know, like we, we go here, Haley is DJ and Haley is always on the scene, has done a lot. Like, you know, why? Why isn't her account? <laughs> I almost said something. Why isn't her account looking like it needs to look? Why is it where her campaign is at the point where they have to turn away volunteers because it's too many? Why Why is it, you know? And again, that's what I had Haley on the podcast. And I told that story about Representative Sauce. And I was like, you know, everybody calls me on Facebook two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock. All my girlfriend always know my phone probably rings because I always get a suicide call. I always get those kind of things. Um, like even though my my specialty is suicide de-escalation. Um, and you know, as hard as I work, I don't get a dime from the state, and I definitely don't get a dime from the city or county. And the people that they do pay to do those things aren't doing the job that they're supposed to do. And I explained to people that everyone wants all this help. They want all these mountains move when their family member has a mental health crisis, something they didn't care about until it was at their front door. And then they want to know why the system is so bad. And I tell them, well, you know, put somebody in the state representative seat that has access to the DCF dollars and makes it easier to get to our community. Um, Go vote, go vote. And you have an awesome, awesome, awesome opportunity with with Haley. Um, Cause I swear if they they raise that, the money that they they pay these state representatives just a little bit, I probably will run, but I couldn't live off that salary. And, and, And God bless Haley. God bless Haley for it, you know what I'm saying? I. Perfect candidate, perfect candidate, and I and I, I I just I can't wait to go in that booth and vote for her, and um, you know one day I probably will join. I thought about it. I really I thought about it so much running, but I was going to run for county commissioner at one point, and I know that I will make a dangerous candidate because what kind of dirt you going to dig on me? You go to YouTube on my documentary. I didn't aired it all out. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know, um, and most people in those seats, they got a lot of dirt that they think is a secret. And if you want to get the air and out stuff, we definitely could do that. But that's the conversation for another day. So I want to ask you, because you, you bring up uh, uh, Rep- Representative Salzman, and I guess for those who are watching, you know, we're in, a, in, in an election cycle uh, to see the interconnectivity between politics and then like what you're doing. And as you say, she gatekeeps the bonds. What what is it that, you know, if you had to say to a to someone running for office, or what would you like to see from a uh uh mental health awareness uh bill or funding, substance abuse funding, uh that folks who are representing us in Tallahassee could do to make it better for those in the space and those who are in need of treatment. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I want to make sure I, rep, I, I understand the uh, question. So like, you you know, you, you mentioned, you said she's, I guess, currently Michelle Solomon is a problem, mm-hmm. right? Within the space of getting funding. Uh, right. What would you, what would you say, like to someone who wants to run for office or what how do we advocate better for us do you want old more increased funding how does how do we prevent the gatekeeping from happening um, uh, does really do that is yeah an awareness issue yeah i think it's a it's a little bit of both like it's awareness yeah. issue because i do like you know why she was telling me all this stuff you know okay so this is how it works 
The same DeSantis wants to write a $3 billion bill for mental health care. Um, he writes that bill. He passes on to the disbursement and, and they give it to DCF. DCF does not go county by county handing out funds. They have DCF managing entities throughout the state. I think it's about 30 that governs the 64, 65 counties we have here. Our DCF managing entity is Northwest Florida Health Systems and their CEO and, my, and, and myself are a good speaking term. So, well, you know, <clears throat> one thing about her, you know, I didn't, she overtaught me so much. I didn't even get a chance to toot my own horn. And just to let her know that, you know, I've met with the um, secretary over DC of the secretary Harris that's in um, um, the Santos cabinet. Um, so, you know, I'm not just some newbie on the block. Um, I did not get certified and learn the ropes in the Scambia County. I learned it on the other side of Florida, a lot more progressive side of Florida and one that celebrates the outside the box thinking. So when she was telling me all this stuff, like I know Mike Watkins, who is the CEO of DCF Manager Institute. I, I didn't, I, I know him as well. I could call him on this personal phone, but I'm just listening to her, listening to her. But it's the holding hostage that you have to come to me, which is not true. Um, but I think that in those two state representatives seats, those is, is one of the quickest way you could get money to pass through to reach our communities without going and jumping through the hoops. Now, I will say to answer your question, the best way to get mental health funding in is outside of any electoral seat. And that's going to Tallahassee and lobby and whistleblowing of what's going on in the Scambia County. And um, I really wish I could do that. Uh, but right now, my employer does not. That would put me in a, put a strange spot. But I'm working on making all those changes because Tallahassee, here I come, you know. Um, what's going on in Pensacola, I tell you, I've been all over the state. I've worked with so many different people on the mental health aspect outside the state. And I tell people all the time, I, if mental health was celebrated, like we celebrate sports, like I will be known everywhere, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately it's not that. It's not a sexy industry, but you know, everyone looks at Pensacola in a lot of different ways when it comes to mental health. They look at us as behind the times, which we are. They look at us as a gold mine, which we are, because they know that if you come up here with the right opportunity, partnered with the right um a nonprofit that's data driven, that has years of data, and you come in under them, you can plant the flag here and you could get a lot of money here because everybody who does have the money here is, is the usual suspects that has become comfortable. How are we the number one in opioid overdoses for the last two years in a row, but yet we only have a 10 bed detox facility? 10 mm. beds. Yeah. It's almost 10 of us on, on this Zoom call now. So if all 10 of us have problems, well, we'll, we'll sew up that, that whole facility that we have. So, you know, if someone can come in outside the box and break through the red tape, which is a Scambia County, and take this thing on and take away contracts from people, we can make real change. I know one thing, I'm exhausted. I am exhausted because this is how sad it's gotten. And, you know, I'm like one of those people I don't put on airs. There was a military family here, military. Um, I don't know who she called, called somebody. They put on this Facebook post saying that they need mental health emergency ASAP. Someone tagged my name. I was tired. I was in bed. It was 10 o'clock at night. And I wrote them. I said, you could give them my number. And I started to give her resources. Hey, you know, this place has a, MR, a mobile response team. They'll come to you. This place. She said, nobody's answering the phone for me. My seven-year-old daughter had a butcher knife this big underneath her pillow. We discovered it. We asked her about it. She had a plan of suicide. We need somebody to come out here right now. I had to go from a long distance to get over there. And I went and I talked to her, talked to the family, and everything was fine. And I didn't get home until about one o'clock in the morning. Here's the kicker. Someone like me, I had to borrow the, I had to ask to borrow the gas money. I had to get the gas money just to get over there. You know, I didn't have the gas money at the time. 
to go help save a life. Where on the other hand, you have these entities that get millions on top of millions of dollars. And she couldn't even get them to pick up the phone. That's what we have here in the Scandal County. You're saying that that the suicide prevention people, are they supposed to be on call um, 24-7? That's what they're supposed to do. Um, there's been times, uh, again, I'm a certified recovery peer specialist um, with the state of Florida, and there's been times to where, like, I had a client. I was very concerned. Their family member reached out. I called the mobile response team, which was 24 hours. That something should have happened. And I called, and they gave me the hardest time the hardest time and i said what's your name what's and because i know their boss and i know people higher up and i want to make sure that they knew that that was going on and so i said well what do i need to do get the sister to call you and she was like yeah i have a family member call me and again mind you i'm i identify myself i identify my certifications I identify i'm working with this this patient and i'm like hey i need you guys to get over there He's schizophrenic. He's in the house with his elderly mom. He can kill her. And she had the biggest attitude. So I had the family member call. They still ain't go. So I don't know what happened within the specific situation with the little girl. And, you know, yeah, that I know what's supposed to happen. I just don't know what happened. But I know from experience what could happen. Man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for going uh, at that late hour, man. Uh, you do not look like a thug, man. <laughs> a thug is what a thug does, and a thug shot up a school this week. I often describe myself as a uh, uh, a good guy with a bad guy face, man. You keep pushing, man. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And, Absolutely, uh, man. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I go. I, I'm, did you raise your hand? Uh, yeah, I and Bill's gonna I say think Derek is the team job. Job. <laughs> But can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So here's my question because Bill brought it up. Because in my mind, I was thinking I read where the mom called the school and she was like, get my son out of the class. I'm telling you, he left this house and he said he's gonna kill people. And and whatever took them so long to figure it out, I don't know. But in what he just said, I'm um, not really the thug side of it, but what do you do in that scenario? Because clearly he was in a state, whatever it was. If he a year before said that he was looking at shooting schools and then you leave your house from your parents and 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 literally carry that out. Um, I just, I don't know. Everything that you said is just like triggering me. <laughs> There's just so much, but in a good way. Um, but for me, I'm just, I can't imagine being that mom. You know, I can't imagine being the people. So I'm not taking away from the fact that I can't imagine being any of those moms, the moms who lost the children, the mom who had the son that she did every, I just can't even imagine having to call a school and say, look, you better hurry up and get my child before he hurts one of your children. That's just catastrophic. Um, and so whatever you're doing to help this world from that, um, I just want to say thank you because I I have three kids, they're grown, and I can't imagine having kids in school right now. It's about I, to I, I don't know. And then at the and you talk about trauma, PTSD. How do you ever move forward? Those kids drug their teacher back in and were taking off their clothes to cover his wounds. I think uh, it's about to taper. I think we may get a few more, but I've always thought that locking those doggone parents up, I mean, locking them up for with some serious jail time, because we know those on the Hill, uh, the, the ones that can pass gun legislation are sold out. The, the, we're not going to get any relief from them. But I've always said that if they start locking, and they lock those two parents up, uh, Earlier in the year with 15 years of peace. I mean, that's real jail time. I think it's about to start tapering once they, they these parents see that they will be responsible for buying a 13 and a half year old a machine gun at Christmas for his birthday 
when six months prior he he called in a shooting up a school order. So let them keep it. That I think that's going to be the answer locking those parents up because ultimately they are responsible. You know, uh, he was in they uh, the FBI had investigated them as well. Absolutely. So, I, you know, why would the dad have the you know the FBI and investigated you? Then why would the dad turn around a few days later, a few for a holiday, and uh, buy AR fifteen or something like that? You know, why would you do that to a thirteen year old and give it to a thirteen year old? You know, I mean. Their mind is not developed yet to to the point where you know they they seeing this stuff on television. People get killed. They in a new movie. They playing these games, and the, the do do we? I mean, do y'all think that he really understood what he was doing, or do you think that he, because he hadn't already said? Do you think he had already planned this out in his mind? I do believe that a 13, 14 year old's brain is not really all that it should be. I agree with that wholeheartedly, Brother Jerry. That's why I'm an uh, advocate or proponent for the parents being responsible because I, I would even go as far as a 16-year-old, a 17-year-old, their brain, they don't, they, it hasn't matured to be able to, I mean, they should know the difference in right and wrong, but we can't overlook the, the mental illness aspect of this situation. And mom recognized when he left that he was in a state. So something was going on. That's why the parents must be held accountable. I disagree with you, uh, Bill, in that at 13 and 14 years old, you do have the mental capacity. I remember being 13 and I remember understanding fully what was going on around me. Um, I could use my age as an excuse for my nonsense behavior, but I knew what was going on. And I think one of the, um, in addition to the jail time for the parents, um, they should they should require that these children uh, be homeschooled. If they are a danger to other children and you know that your child is, has said something, uh, about uh, uh, harming other people at school or teachers, homeschool. I, I agree wholeheartedly that at 13, 14 years old, I was a pretty reasonable thinking person. I do agree with you wholeheartedly, but scientists has proven that the child brain is not mature to the capacity of an adult. I think I think one of the biggest things is when we would <clears throat> what, what, what you said, Bill, and you share all that we always do. Everyone does it. They say, you know, well, when I was 13, when I was 14, you know, this is a new 13 or 14. This is a brand that was social media has made nothing sacred with this young generation. And the number one thing that's not sacred is death. Um, you know, I don't think these kids grasp. The, they know we all know what that is. I don't think they even know that that is something that is sacred. That is something you can't come back from. Even some of these childish adults, you know, on my Facebook feed that jokes about death or the there was a rapper that died named Rich Homie Quan the other day. And the amount of jokes that they have for him. You know, and these are people that brains that are fully developed, you know, and I just don't think that no one has really just with these young kids. They just don't know what death really means. You know, with us, when we were 13, when we was 14, even when I was 14, well, I used to we used to ride around with our music loud. But then when we get by a cemetery, we turn it down, you know, nah, they ain't doing that. You know, we I remember we didn't even cuss at church. Now they'll shoot up a church. So yeah, but that's that's more res us respect that. Mm. And respect has fallen off from the previous generation to now. And it is the fault of the parents that they haven't required the children to have respect. They think it's cute when their kids are cussing. They put they put it on Facebook. Oh, look at him, what he said you know, the B word or whatever, like they, they, they um, have made it cutesy for um, the disrespectful behavior when they're two and three. So when they get six and seven, right now, the behavior is out of control. 
by the time they're 14 and 15, they scared of their own children. So do you think it's because the state uh, has forced, almost forced parents, and, and with some with some good reason that they uh, don't discipline the children uh, in a way that they may need to be uh, disciplined, and I'm talking using psych psychology as well, um, as, you know, uh, taking away something or, you know, I know that time out really is <laughs> is something that that didn't didn't don't really work, you know, in most instances, uh, because our time out was, you know, you got hit upside the head and knocked out. So yeah, <laughs> I think I don't or, or maybe uh, I think we're looking at this the wrong way. I guess that's the best way I can say. It. I think we're looking at this. This is not about freaking time out. This, this is not about, oh, go send them to the room, take their TV away, take their phone away. These are kids, adults, people, whoever it is that are mm -hmm. literally in their mind. And I'm going back to you, Jermaine, just from what he said in their mind, whoever's in their mind is telling them, this is how I can get attention. This is how I can get back at you. I am broken. I am hurting and I need to act out. This is not. Yeah, Bill, I'll give you the parents shouldn't have bought the gun. That's horrible. It's awful because they knew. But in the general cases, that's not the case. The parent has a gun. It's locked up. They break it. They go get it or they lie and say they're going somewhere else. And they come into the school or they go into the shopping area or they go to the ch church or they go to the movie theater. They go some damn where and they are shooting people. And for us to sit here and think that we can fix this right now or even talk about a timeout, or we need to put the parents away. We need to have a way to, I, I used to think that we would, when is enough enough? I guess I'm just at that point. I'm at the point that when is it that we'll be able to, you're talking about being scared of, and I so apologize for the gentleman that you were doing your show, your um, movie on. I apologize, I don't, because I'm not from Pensacola. Um, being scared, but literally people are scared. Literally, people are scared to just leave their house, to drive down the road, to go to the grocery store, to go to the bank, to, to go freaking anywhere. And I'm in a wheelchair and I can tell you now in my life, and I'm not like, I love God. So I know if he takes me, he takes me. But there is an absolute fear that I have that I will be in my chair, somebody will start shooting and I either have to push my chair and roll under something because I can't run like everybody else because they shoot everywhere. And it's not like there's a, 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 a warning. All you're gonna hear is run, gun, shooter, whatever, that's it. And sometimes I'm literally, I hate going to the bank. I hate going to the freaking bank. I don't wanna be in there, but for half a second, because I know I'm just a target to somebody else who has, if you're coming to kill people, I'm just somebody to kill because look, she can't walk anyway, you can go die. And maybe I'm going too deep, but this is really triggering me. And I do have PTSD and I'm triggered right now. Um, uh, so I must be talking. <laughs> but I, thank you for what you're doing. And I thank you for um, for being there when people call, when people need help. And for not, for, for owning and sharing your own story. I, I have a question. Um, yeah, before we sauntered into school shooting, um, uh, my I was curious as to why you thought the scambia or why what it is about the conditions or the, the the lifestyle or community or the environment that is in Scambia County that makes us number one in, in opioid addiction and opioid overdoses, and are there any for for parents or for us or for people who don't know how to spot warning signs? Are there any things that you could suggest that we look for for people who might be suffering in that in from opioid addictions or might be on the verge? So well, I, I, I think it's uh, 
when when it comes to a scam, I think it's just a lot of situations. I think it's like that perfect storm. It's that warm water and the and the hurricane analogy. It's like the funding that we're getting, the money's not going in the right place for education, prevention, treatment, the big three. Those things are not being offered to our community. Um, like to me, coming from Jacksonville, I have um I, every time I go to Jacksonville, I get about a thousand to thirty thousand fentanyl test strips, just little strips that you whatever you're taking, you break off a piece of it, you put it in a bottle cap, put a little water in there, what whatever you're about to take, you stick it in. It's almost like a pregnancy test, and they'll tell you if, if it has the presence of fentanyl. Everyone has them. We in the Scambia County just got them in the last six months, you know, and I think that. It's what we are doing here as far as education, prevention, and treatment. Now, there are some amazing organizations, amazing, amazing grassroots people on the ground doing the work. Our problem here in Escambia County is that we do not back the grassroots, yet we make it harder for them. You know, again, I talk about, you know, my struggles just to even get over to the young lady's house to help, you know. Um, they don't help the people that, matter of fact, um, the RFPs that they put out for the opioid abatement fund almost virtually made it impossible for grassroots organization to get the mental health dollars that was awarded to the state or to the to the county from the um, opioid company uh, when they were sued. And, you know, that's some of the money that they had to pay back. And so that's where the opioid abatement fund comes from. So you got pay people like uh, you know Lakeview Community Health, the um, the Sheriff's Department, all these people getting the money with no problem, but you got boots on the grounds that's running out of money and just doing it out of pure outthinking the problem instead of marrying outthinking without spending the problem. That's number one. Number two, you just have these. Wow, I just tell you, you know. I think people don't realize the common person in the Scambia County don't realize that the days of saying, hey, do you have an Advil? You got a Motrin, uh, Motrin 800 I can take. Those days are over because if somebody give you one and they don't, they got it from the streets, there's fentanyl in it. And mm. there's plenty of times, plenty of times where someone asks for a pill they get it, they take it, they die. No substance misuse. They don't even drink, you know. Um, you know, that was back in those college days. You know, a lot of people like, hey, you got um Adderall that I can stay up and study for this test. You know, that is really, that's a big problem on campuses because people just popping Adderalls for somebody they trust and they got it from somebody that they trust and they end up dying. And uh, because it's the present of fentanyl. And then, you know, um, Narcan. Narcan is not taken serious. You know, the fight to make Narcan free was a big one. And now that Narcan is free, I ride around with boxes on top of boxes in my back seat. I also have fentanyl test strips. People don't want to take it. Don't even know that, that it is it could save a life. Some, you know, we can, we all know, I know we all know about a good five people right now that just love their little joint every now and then. If they get that weed from the wrong person and it has the presence of fit, now all it takes is one salt grain worth of fit and all to kill you. And you only have 60 minutes tops to reverse that overdose or they gone. And Narcan can do that. Um, People don't take advantage of the free Narcan. It's like people like when I try to offer it to them, they're like, oh, I don't do drugs. I don't need it. I'm like, yeah, I'm not a killer, but, you know, I have a gun. You never you rather you don't know when you're going to need it. You know, you rather have it when you don't. I mean, which I don't have a gun. But what I'm saying is, you know, you rather have it when you don't, you know, when the time comes, you rather have it. And that's a whole nother thing as well. Um, and also to the people that do use um, drugs and alcohol. And I, I'm speaking from experience where you go into these hotel rooms that, you know, everyone is just getting plastered 
whether it's coke, whether it's this, whether it's that, someone take the wrong thing and they overdose everybody in the room. This never happened to me, but I've had enough clients the way I know. Everybody in the room gone. They leave that, that person there for dead. They are unaware that Florida has the Good Samaritan Act to where that if you call the police and the police show up and they save that life or not, and you sit there with them, you cannot be charged for nothing in that room. And that's the Good Samaritan Act. And people, instead of sticking around, helping, calling the police, they're gone. And, you know, a simple phone call could have probably helped save their life because, you know, the 911 operator on the other end could have said some useful things to help them until, you know, someone um, shows up. So even still, like, you know, going into when we used to canvas, I know you guys know more about canvassing than anyone else, but when we used to canvass for the substance misuse part of it, and we go into these hotels like the Red Roof Inn or whatever, and we're like, hey, here's 42 boxes of Narcan. They're like, oh, we don't want that. But they know that they have nothing but drug use in because nobody on this on this Zoom, if we had to go stay somewhere in Pensacola in the hotel, that would not be our uh, that would not be our 78th or 79th pick. It won't be, it won't make it in the top 100. So they know where their money is coming from. They know what's going on in those rooms and they won't even take the Narcan because they know that they're going to get a call that someone is up here dying. And they're like, oh no, that's going to be, uh, that that's going to make it bad for us. No, the deaths make it bad for you, you know. But, you know, that's, that's just a whole nother thing. I was on um, Sunshine's show shout out to sunshine i love sunshine um i was on sunshine corner with councilman wiggins um uh, and chip simmons um very surprised of the lack of knowledge chip simmons had for some of the things that i'm talking about big problem that's why we all those things that i discussed plus a couple more things is a perfect gumbo pot for the number one rank. And we're going to stay there for probably another 36 months until some change. So and that's going, just that ranking you don't want to have. That's the spot you don't want to have. Going back to uh, uh, the depression and bipolar. So have, you know, I know it was a study came out that we had markers on our DNA from uh, that, that from slavery that PTSD because we will never uh, um, you know, dealt with we we never got counseling coming out of it, and mm -hmm. we never got psychological treatment that we needed to to redevelop to uh, reverse that that slave uh, mentality that has been uh, thrust up on us for so many centuries. Have 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 you looked at that? Um, have, you know, while you were uh, while you were working with people as far as the being how how did that work with you as far as dealing with it uh that something that triggers people to cause them to uh want to do uh drugs yeah i you know that's that's funny you brought that up that's my number one tool to use when i speak to black people before mental health became something of the culture of black culture you know now you know there's a lot of black people talking about mental mental health and you know the the presence of it but um dr rachel yuda um in mount sinai school of medicine in new york she pioneered that study of epigenetics that's the name of it it's right. epigenetics and but of course you know i don't know what her intentions was but for the masses it was powered by the Holocaust and not slavery, but you know, whatever. So <laughs> um, like, yeah, absolutely. Trauma, PTSD can be passed down from genetics. And I think like, you know, and that's why I tell a lot of people, if you don't have a mental illness of your own, you already have something that's been passed down to you because it's not, it just, again, it doesn't just stop from slavery because Slavery was, we all know that it was bad, but that was so far from our realm. Um, not that far because, you know, my grandmother's mother was a slave and that doesn't, you know what I'm saying? That's not that far from me. But what's closer is Jim Crow. And my mom, you know, my aunts, they went through Jim Crow. You know, they saw those things. Um, 
and Jim Crow leaves that that lasting epigenetic change in you. And then I even go a step further. I'm, I was looking, I can never think of the name of the acronym. Why, what's the full name? But there's something called ACES scores, A-C-E-S score. And it's a simple test anyone could take. And it's for, a, I know it's a bench, child experience, something like that. It asks you a list of questions. It asks you, and it's it's really aimed for everyone. It's not a black thing or a white thing. But when you take these questions, you would think it would aim for us, because it tells you where you are, for the uh, where you how high it is for you to have a mental illness. They ask you, have I'm just going to speak frank, and this is not how they word it. Have you have your mom and dad ever fought in front of you? Have you seen someone shot? Have you you know those kind of things we see every day in the hood. And um, and then it gives you a score. And if you fall in the range, you know, they urge you to get a mental health evaluation. Now, I think that all untreated um, mental illness puts you in a prime spot to become. Um, in so many words, I added, I hate using the word addict, but un untreated mental illness. That's what it does, because, again, I. So once I got sober, the confetti drops, we popping bottles. We are like, yes, I did it. And really the hard work just began for me. When I, I was like, I got sober. Everyone told me, oh, you need to stop doing these damn drugs. I finally stopped doing the damn drugs and everything is still the same. I'm still lashing out. I'm still doing these things. And I did something that nobody in my family and nobody in my circle or even nobody I knew did. I went to get a mental health evaluation. I had someone tell me, man, you did what white people do. You know, that's a problem. That is a problem. And once I start, I hate medication. Oh, I hate it. But I was on medication for the first year. I don't like being a slave to anything. And um, but and I know that's kind of funny when I was slave to drugs, but then I traded in one drug for another. And I was on Zoloft for a year. But I had a, a therapist and my life coach and, a, and my therapist, again, it's good. I, I hate when people, and this was my message when I spoke at the Black Mental Health Symposium last year, was stop telling people to go get therapy and put a period on it. That's just like telling people to go vote. That's so irresponsible. Tell them how to vote. You go tell people to go vote and they go vote for Trump, then now you got egg on your face. No, it's it's... Go tell them to get the therapist that knows you, that can understand your world, that can better help you. Why would I go get a 70 year, 78 year old, I guess for that age, Tea Party Republican kind of guy, therapy that, you know, he really wants to help. He leaves his his biases at home and he wants to help me. And I come in and I'm like, yeah, you know, and I tell him my world of growing up in Mars Court, the old Mars Court, not the new one. Telling them, you know, just just tell them, painting a picture that he only hears about. How he's supposed to help me? Now, if I go get this hot shot therapist that just graduated from FAMU and moved back to Pensacola, and all I got to say is, yeah, when I walked out, man, I had the man. It's it's beer bottles and, and she, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I'm from Madison Court. I seen that too. And even though I got a degree, I know what you, you know. So it's like my therapist was a. He's, he's a couple of years older than me. He's a Haitian. Um, his name is Dr. Belazare. And one thing I loved about it, because I'm an aggressive guy. I'm a strong-minded guy. I'm a guy that even though my father died, Malcolm X was my father from the grave. That's how I learned how to be a man. And I I mean, like, you got you can't be no weak man in front of me talking. I grew up with with, with Derek as, as my tutor and Jerry McIntosh as, <laughs> as my Saturday school teacher and my mentor was Leroy Boyd. You cannot deal with me any kind of way. And here comes Dr. Belazare, a Haitian. You cannot bullshit him. I mean, <laughs> it is like you have, and I tell you what, he guided me to the mental wellness that I have today. I mean, like, I was like, goodness gracious. I He prepared me to get off the Zoloft. He prepared me to, to so many things. I think it's good to take 
medication for about that first year until you learn how to do things yourself, you know? And when I say that, now I get to a point to where like, instead of the medication calming me down, I've already built my my toolbox through therapy to say, okay, my girlfriend gonna say this. And, and once she says something, I don't like, I come in at three o'clock in the morning and she like, why are you coming in at three o'clock in the morning? I think the whole thing out. Instead of I... First off, I think what I want to say, hey, shut up. You came in three o'clock last week. That's what I want to say. Then she going to say this, then she going to say that, then I'm be on the couch for two weeks. And then I look at the alternative. I think that out, and then I choose wise. But when you don't have a grip on your mental health, you can't even fathom to do that. You're just going to pop off on whatever that symptom tells you to do. And, um, and I think that's just, I don't think people really understand that i i uh chip simmons had a round table on gun violence last year this was right before i moved back and um this is how i <laughs> this is how i met salzman to have that meeting with her and everything. i was there i remember oh were you there <laughs> yeah, i remember seeing you there yes sir i um Chip didn't even want to call on me because he remembered me as chief simmons when he was with ashton hayward and uh, I put so much pressure on Ashton. He invited me to the mayor's office. That's a whole nother conversation. But so he didn't want to call on me. So I just went up and I took the mic. And I think he was expecting the old Jermaine, as they call me, the call me from the past. But I broke down how PTSD can easily lead to gun violence and the, the lapse of mental illness with gun violence, how that works, and the need for mental wellness and treatment and mental health dollars in the Scambia County. And I and I say now, like I told them, like I tell everyone else, if you can get everyone to a state of mental wellness, that will solve 86% of society's problem. The, the school shootings, the drug usage, the um, the homelessness, the everything. If you get everybody their mental wellness somewhere to where it needs to be or close, everything else will fall in the line. You know, can you imagine a mental wellness Trump? Yeah, I uh, uh, <laughs> I, I believe wholeheartedly with what you said uh, as far as the right people in the right places, Mister Williams goes. I walked away from that uh, so-called gun violence round table with the notion that, man, I just wasted an whole hour because the powers that be went around the table giving each other a bunch of attaboys. Mm. And it was amazing that it was not a gun violence round table. They just wanted to uh, pat each other on the back and say mm. uh, other things that they had done or were in the process of doing, but nothing about curbing gun violence. And I walked away said, they knowing in my heart that I would never waste my time with another one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I um I don't know. I just I just think that um, you know, I just applied everything you all are doing. I mean, you all I, I when I was living in Jacksonville, I would tune in a lot um and and listen to what you all are saying because I, I my heart never left Pensacola and um or the panhandle for those of you in Okaloosa and Santa Rosa. Um, <laughs> I, I I love this area. I probably will die in this area. Um I can go I was making almost $27 an hour doing what I'm doing in Pens in Jacksonville. And I came back home because I know I was needed here and I make significantly less. And um but I know one thing about it is it's just, it's a sad state, same old, same old. And I expect it from some of the people that don't look at like me, but it's very, very, very sad for the people in a position that can make a change that don't, and they look exactly like me. Mm -hmm. I don't so, think I have to tell you who that is. So Jermaine, um, I know you. we talked about uh, gun violence, but do you think by not being able to sue the gun manufacturers when students are shot up in school and then the politicians who who run on guns, who advertise with guns in their hands, do you think that has a detrimental effect on uh, the students and people that that's watching um, 
these uh these politicians who you know when you see them shooting off their guns and stuff you know to to get votes do you think it has an effect on those young people that that are out there uh shooting up the schools oh absolutely i think that just that gives them a bump in confidence and almost a get out of jail for free card kind of thing can you can you imagine uh someone running for president that 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 will take a bump of coke um right there while they're addressing the nation you know is giving everyone confidence well hey you know i could go i go smoke weed you know uh do do whatever i want to do and and that's and that's just so unfortunate because you know when there was an opioid problem the opioid manufacturers had to pay but the gun, the, the people that make the guns and and those kind of you 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 can't hold them accountable, and so it's just a pick and choose situation, and I think it's very dangerous, you know, very dangerous for, um, and they and they won't even stand up. The only thing that they send out is heartfelt condolences, you know, and I think we all go about how the heartfelt condolences. You know, and, and but they don't want to come after the NRA. They don't want to have to, they don't want to come after those kind of people. They don't want to, you know, wh- whoever is backing them in this kind of dollars, it, it, it's sad. We just re- need an all out revolutionary on our politicians. We just need the, everybody needs to be fired and we just need, and not just nationwide, local, every local politician. I mean, I think. Everything that you said, uh, Mr. McIntosh, is true when it comes to the gun manufacturer. But I think that those of us that sit idly on the on the sidelines is more to blame than them. And you know, one thing that Haley that has shown, and and you know, Killer Mike or uh, or uh, Scarface, the rapper, these guys have all ran for some kind of office. I know. Uh, Scarface didn't win. Um, but to me, like there's we all can run. We all can do certain things. This is uh social media has even the playing field to where this ain't the 90s, to where like you know, you had to make serious noise to be seen. And um, you know, so it's so much power nowadays to make those changes. And I think that just it's true that we need to come after these politicians that's doing more, that's not doing more than just pretty fancy words. You know, we do need to come after them, but at some point, and I'm not talking about the people, can you imagine if, well, I think the tri-county area here is about what, 600,000 people, somewhat like that. 750,000, I don't know. Um, I know you guys get people elected all the time. Y'all might know better than me, but let's just say it's 600,000 people. If we had at least half of those people that had the attitude and the way of thinking of everybody on this Zoom call, what kind of change that would make in just this area right here, you know? And for for the Republicans, they even come plant a flag in our state every year with no words. It's this tri-county area right here that carries them, you know. Um, and this is a gimme. This is a gimme. They don't even have to make a stump here if they don't want to, you know. Um, and I think that if we do the right things here, I think it will catch on. I mean, Pensacola, I don't think people really understand how important, how much of a mecca Pensacola in this area was throughout the country back in the Reconstruction area, days of the John Sunday, days of, you know, we had our own Black Wall Street here. And I think that Pensacola still has, and I, you know, like I said, I just moved from Jacksonville. And I tell all them people from St. Augustine all the time, you guys are the second city. You're not the first. I come from the first city in America. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so we, we, we have a lot of power here. We have a lot of power here. And I think that we are a sleeper giant that's been asleep far too long. And we can really hold a lot of people accountable. We could. We could. And I think it's just a common man that sits down and just take it. School shootings, those kind of things. We take it. We take it. A lot of people get upset at the kitchen table. And that's that's it. You know, getting upset at the kitchen table don't at the kitchen table don't make any changes. And I think, you know, not you guys' generation, our generation, we're too soft to make change. You know, that Birmingham 
uh, uh, bus. I, I went to see Rosa Parks uh, Museum a couple months ago, and I, I learned about it out of a book. But to see everything in that museum, it's become interactive. I don't know when the last time you all have went up there, because most people that flock up there, they go to the uh, to the other one, the, the the big one, the new one. I can't think of the name of it, uh, the Mass Incarceration Museum. But that um, that, that, that that Birmingham bus revolutionary. Oh, that was that was so much to take what people would walk miles to him. We ain't got that in us no more. And that's why I tell these young folks, man, like, man, it's a damn shame that, you know, people like Mr. McIntosh, Mr. McIntosh is supposed to be, we're supposed to come to him for a Heisman. He shouldn't be leading the charge. He should be in a grandfather role overseeing and not leading the charge. Like it's it's our turn now. But yet we worry about the wrong things. We do the wrong things. Hell, half of the men out here can't even take care of their dang on children, you know. Okay. And and uh, Jill, I, I when you when you asked about um, you know, the school shootings and all those things, as much as I believe that mental health could turn things around, and as much as I, th I think right now we're just living in a time of biblical, and there ain't much you could do with that because it's rare. You know, you just got to do what you can do, pray what you can pray and let the chips fall where they may. And that's another thing, like all of us, we just take on so much because we want to make so much change. It keeps us up at night. It takes us it takes it, it goes home with us. But one thing we all got to know when you did all you could do is you just got to stand. You know, you can't you can't take on that much weight because we are all one person and we all spend our whole lives fighting for people our whole entire life and it got to get to a point to where like don't forget to, to live your life you know i don't know i just will just move to say that because mr mcintosh i i just remember like nobody can't tell me who my people are who black people are and that came from that saturday school they used to make us chant him and miss mcintosh used to make not you know it their knowledge is power you know it. i don't want to spend, take up time yes. uh, reciting that we are the real kings and queens of africa i know these things mm -hmm. but can you imagine for every one person of me that know it there's a thousand of us that look like me that didn't know it never was taught it, and they believe anything that was spoon fed through them through um a system that was educate that would use education against us and i think that um i don't know which <laughs> which one said it. it could have been booker t i don't know but they say it's easier to um build up the new than repair the old and i know they didn't i'm paraphrasing and um so i just think we just have to just just start focusing on these babies now <laughs> i don't know it keeps me up every night and I can't, I bump my head against the wall just like you all do. And I don't know how I can get the people to care enough to vote. I don't know how I could get the people to care enough to go get their mental wellness in order. I don't know. They don't care. They care about those things that pass away so easily and don't mean nothing to you. And it's just a lost generation. Well, you know, one of, one of the things uh, that uh, yeah, I know you said, you know, is could be, you know, biblical. But it's also legislation, you know, mm. the legislators pass these laws where people cannot sue gun manufacturers and gun lobbyists and, you know, the NRA, that that legislation was passed. And then, you know, because like you said earlier, they've been bought and paid for themselves. And so they don't they won't do anything to help uh, quell the situation because they use the Second Amendment as if. And no other amendment in the in the Constitution uh, counts for anything. The First Amendment, you know, everything under that, they 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 ignore that part of it. You know, um, as a matter of fact, they want you to stop protesting, which is a right under the First Amendment. You know, they want you to stop speaking, which is a right under the First Amendment. They don't want you to write. Uh, they don't want the media to write about what's going on, especially in truth, but, you know, because that's what it's really all about. And you're right when, you know, one of the things that Elijah Muhammad talked about years ago is teach a person who they are, you know, and that's what we were doing on Saturday. We was teaching people who they were. We, you know, 
we always thought of um, young people as young adults coming up to adulthood, coming into a new age uh, that was going to lead the world into a new place. And so that has got to, that has got to be, again, uh, something that all of us do to teach each other uh, who we are, where we come from, how we got to this uh, place that we are now. What what are the conditions that caused us? Then we got to go. Then we have to go back to the early 1900 when there was a purge of black people in this country. And you know we talk about uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Black Wall Street, but there were many Black Wall Street. There was over 60 towns and cities that were built by black people that were burnt to the ground from Tennessee to Chicago to New York. Uh, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma, here in Florida, you know, Texas, you go, you know, you Mississippi, all of these places, were, you know, that was burnt to the ground. That meant the economic side and the psychological side. You know, we we not only will we suffer from PTSD from slavery, but from, like you say, through Jim Crow, but through the purge that took place in the cities that was burnt. Uh, people lost, many lives were lost, but they blamed it on us that we were the riders. We, you know, we were the one that doing the riding. Uh, but it was massacres that was taking place and the government did nothing to stop it. The, the state police and, uh, governors was all part of the, the will to help the clan to keep this, these things going to this day. The Klan has not been has not been held responsible for the things that they are doing, and they are still Klan members uh, here in the United States. Uh, but they killed off all the Black Panthers who were just trying to feed people and give them a new attitude and and break up the fear factor that was taking place in in uh, in our country. But they wiped all them out, you know, overnight. Just because they wanted to have, so that's because we were saying self-defense. And and when you said that, you thought that the young generation, and that's why you and Miss McIntosh did so much on that Saturday school, because you thought, you know, that would be the right. And I still think that to this day, this is much of a, a lot of us have made it out. And you know, and again, even though this generation is lost, I don't, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw them away either, because you know, at one point, Malcolm Little in Detroit Red never knew that they were he was going to be Malcolm X right. and um you know but like you said um I think a lot of people subscribe to uh J. Edgar Hoover's um Cointel Pro and the reason behind it now I mean they really felt that the black rise of a black messiah was intimate and that it would destroy some of the hateful things that were going on in this country and um you know, that prophecy is still there. I mean, I think two sides of the coin believe in the same thing, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, they're going a lot further than what they did back in those days to, to stop that rise of a black messiah. And I don't think that the rise of the black messiah is a person, you know, it's a wave, it's a belief, it's a system, it's a, you know, it's a function that is contagious to every black person. And, uh, you know, and that's why it's so sad when I see on, uh, man, these young folks, man, they, uh, oh, man, you know, I'm I'm voting for Trump because I'm like, it's just, it's unreal. It's unreal. And I think that, I don't know, I, I don't know what we have to do to kind of combat this because we live in at a time of real, real change within these young folks, like really and truly. Um, some of the things, you know, there, there's this, this group in Jacksonville, like I, like I said, I used to live there, but this thing has become nationwide. Uh, this rapper, Young and Ace and Fulio, um, I don't know if y'all, the, the name Julio Fulio, you know, is familiar, but he got killed in, in Tampa. But these two groups will kill each other off and they'll make these music where they're mocking the dead. They'll go to their grave site. They're urinating on each other's grave site. They're doing it. This is what everyone in that age bracket is 
taken to. This is what they're taken by. This is what they're gravitating to. This is what they're trying to duplicate. There's people in Pensacola rappers that's doing that same thing. Kim, most of this stuff that you've seen is rap beef. That kind of beef, the, the guy that jumped off the, the bridge and all, all that stuff stemmed from rap. So, you know, you have these young folks that see no value in themselves and see no value of the person that looked like them. And then they see they're in, whether it's entertainment or whatever, but this is the new rule. This is the new thing, you know, disrespect the dead. Death is not sacred, you know. And whenever you get those kind of people, those kind of beliefs, like if you thought you, you had an uphill battle with my generation, <laughs> wow, this, these new generations do not care. They do not care. I'm scared of them. I'm scared of these young boys. Like, for real, they don't care. They do not care. They do not value life. They don't value their own life. They don't value their family's life. And, and to me, I always feel like we have to look inward before we can look outward. And right now, inside of us, when I say inward, not the person, but our community, it's looking dark, it's looking grim. And I think that, you know, you did a great job, Dr. Ma uh, Mr. McIntosh, of you know, rising up certain people. Cause I know some of the people that were in, in our um, Saturday school. I know there's a lot of people that went there and they're doing great things right now. And unfortunately it was about 30 and 40 of us and not 30,000 and 40,000 of us. <laughs> and those ones, you could tell the ones that didn't come to Saturday school because they have babies and then they're their baby's friends. They're not their parents, they're their friends. Then they have children. And the parent that, that they was taught was to be your child's friend. And now these children don't respect the mama or the grandmama and nobody else. And they're the one that's causing all this ruckus. And that was a link that's been missing. And how we repair that link, it's going to be harder than what it was to tear it up. Yeah. And, I, and, and go ahead, Kristen. Oh, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, like you were saying about the program that you have done, um, funding has been a problem for us forever. And, you know, and sometimes it's our fault as well, because sometimes we won't give a dollar to save our own children. And, you know, and it's like move for change. You know, people call and want things done. And then, you know, after that, and once they get their problem solved, <laughs> it's, you know, it's like, I don't care anymore. You know, I got my, I got mine solved. You know, if you ask them to even buy a ticket, oh, that's too much. I mean, you're talking about once a year raising funds to try to keep the organization going for another year until you get to the next fundraiser, <laughs> you know, but, but, uh, and you try to keep the ticket so everybody can afford it. But, you know, thing, you know, what people fail to realize, things are changing. And, you know, legislation has caused that to change. The way we do business, uh, the way we protest, and all of that has changed to the point where, you know, everybody can lose everything. You know, the organization, your livelihood, or, you know, homes, everything, the way, the way it's set up now. And that's what has to change. And that's why voting is so important. You can, like you were saying, we got to get the right people, the right people in place uh, so that we can have people that who understand legislation uh, properly. That's going to affect everybody. That's, that's, you know, for the good, uh, what I'm talking about. But the legislators that are there now, they care nothing about. Uh, the majority of the people, they just care about the, they are really their owners who are feeding them from the trough of nothing but money. Yeah, I, I tell people all the time, I wish these politicians were like NASCAR and you could see all the uh, logos that own them on their blazer. That, that, that help out a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stephen, you was about to say something. <laughs> 
Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much for, for being here, your, your honesty and just being you. Um, and I would say you combat the situation we're in with every phone call you pick up, with every time you step out of the house, with every conversation that's intentional that you have, you're combating it. You being here today um, and just being you, you're combating it. You're making it better. You know what I mean? Like, like I just want you to, to, to know that nothing is lost because you're still fighting it. You know, you haven't, you took um, what you were talking about with Saturday school and, um, you know, I, I, I'm not from here, um, but my children's first school was in Anacostia, D.C. Um, there was somebody who started a school in the area where more black men went to jail than went to college. She did that on purpose. It was purposeful. Not only was she raising up and training these incredible young men, but impacted our families. How I looked at things, how I thought about things, things that, that I wasn't even aware that I was doing. So every time you go out and you speak, you take that lessons from Mr. and Mrs. McIntosh. You're taking that heart of Derek Scott. You're doing that every single time. I want to tell you, I remember I picked my son up from school. He was in pre-K. Again, we're in Anacostia, D.C. I heard shots go off. I remember looking around. I was like, how do I tell my four-year-old on his birthday to duck in a car seat? So every time you go out and speak, every time you go out and tell the stories, that's what you're changing. Then when we got out of the area, we called the school to say, hey, we heard gunshots as we were leaving. I didn't know where it was. They had, he had looked at somebody the wrong way on a bus. This young man was coming to put the kids on the bus. Because they're, they're, they have somebody to go on each bus with the kids to make sure they're, they're dropped off appropriately and go to the right person. They shot him at the front door. We drove by, by there. I didn't know where it was. We drove by there. And he died at that front door. You know, I'm from, I call Upper Marlboro, Maryland home. I remember coming home. My brother's teacher walked in a restroom and a kid was selling a gun that he stole from his police officer father. That teacher was shot in the bathroom, found by the kids. All those school shootings and stuff, yeah, we didn't have them so much in the school, but we had them at our bus stops. We had them leaving the school. They were written off to gang violence and 99% of the time it wasn't gang violence. So, and I mean, and I'm 40 some years old. So, you know, I'm in my late forties, you know, and that, and that's how I grew up. I can tell you here in Santa Rosa County, you know, my husband's still active duty. When he was what we call a first sergeant in the Air Force, 90% of his time was going to go pick somebody up because of suicidal ideations. That's what 90% of his time was. Before I went into ophthalmology, I worked as a chaplain assistant. I worked, I took the calls, I, I did all that. We are, were trained in, in suicide prevention. We know what to do. That was probably 85% of my calls. That in domestic violence. And the two are interlocked. So what I would say is there is nothing, nothing, nothing that is over. Nobody can be written off. And you fight it. Everybody here on the show fights it by coming and speaking truth. It's when we lift our hands up and say we can't do it anymore. That's when it's gone. But you're doing it. And every single person you look in the eyes, when you go back into those rooms, because 90% of us can't go into those rooms, you take those stories with you. So thank you.
Thank you. Uh, one of the one of the things, uh, you know, uh, just real quick, uh, Jeremy. Um, how this executive that used to be, uh, he said he was an executive with, you know, he would be in the room with all these, with the rappers and and all of that. And he said he asked a question. Uh, and he said, uh, he said, uh, he asked them, would they allow rappers to sing to their, you know, to do the same thing with their children? So they said, no, we're not going to let them do that. He said, would you let it happen with a dog? I said, no. But they was willing to let rappers and say anything about killing other Black people, other rappers, and all of that. But they were not even willing to let them sing about killing a dog. But it was okay to sing about killing Black people and, you know, and all the other things that um, that causes people in many instances who don't understand to go out and think it's okay to shoot somebody because a rapper said. Yeah. I think they get incentivized to right. uh, to to rap about certain things as it pertains to us. Their kids exactly. don't listen to that kind of stuff. But um it, it and it's working. So um maybe we need to be a little bit more independent in the way that we put out music so we can have the type of messaging that we want for our community. Um, we need we need to do something because it's getting out of hand. And I do think that we need to take more of an active part in, in all aspects, um, the, the, the music, the content that, um, that our, our community sees. Um, which Jermaine is doing with his um, with his with his content and it's clinical and even the um, Willie Jr. story. It's all it's it's about us. It's by us, and maybe we need to get back to that. One of the things when, when I, I know when during the civil rights movement, the music, the music had had messages that was great messages, you know. Uh, you know, when Sam Cook sung, change is going to come. You know, even Aretha Franklin respect. She didn't do it as a as a as a uh, anthem to the movement, but it became an anthem to the movement. You know, uh, just many other songs. You know, when you go back and listen to the Temptation and all of them, all of them had a song. Marvin Gaye. Uh, all of them had songs that had messages in them that was great messages. Uh, the OJs, you know, uh, when you go back, because, you know, I know the number one hits is what most people uh, hear. But then there were other songs on the flip side that most people, you know, back, back then, you know, it they, they was called, uh, well, the, the flip side was the other side of the record. The B the, side. Yeah, the B side, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so it, all those songs had great messages in them. And, uh, you know, even the gospel music had great messages, you know. And when they when there was a meeting, they would play that radio, I mean, that song on the radio, meeting tonight, you know. So everybody knew it was going to be a meeting tonight. Everything was done with the music back then to get people out to the to the churches and to the you know the all the other things all the other movements that was taking place at that time but it but it, at the same time it was a whole lot of young people all of them were young people who were really leading the movement back then i mean when you think about it you know martin luther king and when they started out he was like 20 years old something like that he was murdered at 39 malcolm was murdered at 39 you know matt uh um uh, 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 was Mega Evers. None of them, I don't think, made 40 years old. But they was uh, real fighters. They knew what they wanted to do. They knew that it was a possibility uh, that they would lose their, their lives uh, before they were, you know, even 40 years old. But uh, uh, like everybody said, I'm glad you still, you know, still willing to do the work that needs to be done to save somebody's life. To get up at, I know what it's like to get up at two or three o'clock in the morning, going somewhere to do something, somebody, or to get them out of jail or something, you know. 
and you know, and don't complain about it. You just go back home and hopefully get to bed on, you know, so you can get up the next day. But <laughs> so yeah, so, uh, I'm happy to see that that uh, you have, you know, your your life has changed and you're doing great things with it and and doing great things for other people and helping to. Which it like it's uh, uh Cheryl said with your content is going to help many many more people because absolutely action yeah I'm putting absolutely. it back in your hand there well I just want to say I appreciate you uh for spending the entire time with us uh yeah. tonight this was a very much needed conversation a very good one and I'm glad that uh you were with us tonight it's actually good to we could all talk about knowledge power you know we, uh, I think we could say that chant or maybe we start closing out the show with it uh, you know as we go back to it but it's uh, I think it's that ingrained in us so much that we know it I, I appreciate you uh coming when it's time uh for us to go to Amazon to uh see the Willie Jr. documentary uh, I am <laughs> I am excited because I'm absolutely dying to see if the interconnectivity of the of the rumors of the you know the big name families that some folks who probably shouldn't mention that we bought this from and all the other people you know may have bought cars from at some point in time uh, come to, come to play in this uh, in this uh, in this discussion. But I'm I'm super excited because I will I will forever remember where I was when I heard the alleged story of the rumor as I got it when it, you know, of his untimely passing. So I'm excited that you're taking on this project. Uh, please share with those of us, you can send it to me on Facebook, the, how we can see the, uh, uh, it's clinical so that the rest of us can watch it. Cause I know we had, uh, in Cindy's, I think Cindy Martin had an event the night of the year, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, lot your viewers so we weren't able to go i know i wasn't able to go so i was committed to that already but we appreciate you uh for coming with us to hang out these uh this afternoon and we look forward to it and i'll you know i'll spend i'll spend the time uh giving christina and jill the rundown of the the rumor of what happened with mr willie jr <laughs> so they can be ready for the amazon uh, uh, release for that, you know, for and also I would say he for uh, Christina and Jill, he had the the nations or the world's first drive to, yes, uh, funeral. To funeral home. And he what's, what's so crazy that. about that, he he actually was a question on Hollywood Squares in the night. Yeah. They asked, um, is there a drive through? Funeral home in Pensacola. The answer, the lady answered no, and of course it was yes, it was his. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Jill, Jill, Christina, not drive through as in you set the body up and like you see him in cars and stuff, but you just could pay your respects to you instead of going in like for a week and putting pre river stuff. Yeah, it wasn't a fast food funeral. Yeah. 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 It wasn't like boom, boom. Yeah. <laughs> no. But he was a trendsetter, so you see them across the nation. Yeah. Uh, I wish we happened could. here in Pensacola. And um, I would love that. I can't wait to talk to you off camera about it because I'd say a lot, lot more. Uh, but I do want to <laughs> let you all know, though, I appreciate everything you guys are doing because when I do get a chance, I do tune in every Sunday. You guys are, are st uh, every Sunday. I can guarantee two things. Church going to happen and y'all going to be here talking everything. <laughs> me, you know? And um, whether I'm in Jacksonville or, you know, for the longest, you know, just you guys showing up here every, every Sometimes when I get tired and I forget what I'm fighting for, even if I spend seven to 12 minutes listening, you know, it's a good outlet to recharge because it's always on my time line on a Sunday. And, you know, we all know Sundays, I don't, the type of work that I do, uh, compassion fatigue, it's very easy to set in and you're like, I'm tired. Uh, I have no help. I'm draining. I'm throwing my money into it. Da, 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 da. I don't want to do this no more. And then you tune in and then you hear y'all just, I'm like, okay, I'm ready for Monday. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so 
I thank y'all for what y'all doing because you you know you just never know who's watching and what they need to hear. And you know, you just I promise you never know. I, I just I remember vividly I was just sitting in Jacksonville and uh Miss McIntosh was like, call in if you got something to say. The number is uh, I said, let me call it. <laughs> I called on in and um it was just really great. And, you know, that was the last time I spoke with her was on this platform. But we had a great, all of you all were here. All of you all were here. And we had a great conversation about what we have to do to flip the Scambia Blue. And we it was just, it was great. And I was, I remember even in Jacksonville, that recharged me for my Monday. Uh, when this was when I was working at the suicide hotline. Um, and I was even taking overnight calls. And I was like, yeah. Um, everybody is in their lane. I'm, I'm like, you know, they over there in that Zoom call, they in their lane driving fast. Let me go get back in the car and jump in my lane. And uh, I so think, I think uh, why I think kept people. a lot more people are watching than lead on to and a lot of prominent folks. I promise oh, you, I hear it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Our, our time is up, but I just want to, because she's running for president, uh, the truth we hold. Uh, you know, the American Journey by Kamala Harris. Hopefully, uh, instead of vice president, we will be calling her Madam President in the next few months, <laughs> in the next 50 so days. Uh, but there, see. Well, if nothing else, we are way over time. I'm sure Mr. Vernon has already cut us off the air, but we will see you next week. Uh, same channel, same place. Have a good week, everybody. Good Thanks night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night.